and welcome. Please take a seat, get cozy and enjoy a cup of terror with me, Stephanie Valentine. Hello my spooky little pumpkins. Thank you for joining me today. A Cup of Terror is a series where I talk about true crime cases that have a dash of the strange, be that supernatural, to do with the occult or just something downright odd. Now we're out in nature today as you can see. Um, I apologise if it's very windy and you can hear it and also my hat might fly off uh, but we thought we'd enjoy the nice weather because it's been raining a lot lately um, but I did forget my tea. Boo! Okay so there is a trigger warning for today's video. There will be a lot of talk about suicide and I will be reading extracts from some letters and notes that mention suicide and suicidal thoughts so please don't watch um, if this is going to affect you, you know, take care of yourself and I will see you in one of my next ones, hopefully. So, today's case involves a love triangle and a scandalous murder that ends with a haunting, true crime and a ghost story. Mm, you know that I was very intrigued when I heard of this case. Um, true crime and ghosts, you know, love it. But in all seriousness, this case is really sad. It's like really tragic as well. Like, I mean, I know all crime and murder are no laughing matter, but I don't know, this one just made me really sad when I was researching it. So Francis Mawson Rattenbury was born on the 11th of October, 1867 in Leeds, England, to John Rattenbury and Mary Mawson. Francis studied at Leeds Grammar School, where he was a top student, and then he went on to study at Yorkshire College, also in Leeds. In 1885, he began an apprenticeship at his uncle's architecture firm, Lockwood and Mawson, which was located in Bradford. He soon craved more for his life and career, and he had heard of the many opportunities for working in the architectural field in Canada. So, not long later, in the spring of 1892, when he was 24 years old, he emigrated to Vancouver, British Columbia. Francis was a very inexperienced architect, so he wasn't getting a lot of offers of work. Francis was a bit naughty, though, as um, he kind of, you know, Put the rumour out there that he trained under renowned British architect Henry Lockwood who had been business partners with his uncles. The thing is Henry had died when Francis was still a little boy though and they'd never met. Naughty Francis! Francis actually had no formal training, no proper qualifications but with this little lie he managed to get a commission to design a house which helped him out financially during those first few months. That year in Victoria, a competition had been announced to design the new legislative parliament buildings in Victoria. Francis entered the competition under the pseudonym ABC Architect. He was a very ambitious man and he had a lot of grand plans. His design for the buildings was a 600,000 square foot group of buildings blending Romanesque, Classic and Gothic architectural styles. 66 other people entered the competition from around the world, but to many people's surprise, Francis ended up winning it somehow. The little lie about working with the renowned architect probably helped swing things in his favour. Now, the, the process didn't go smoothly. There were a lot of delays and problems, including going over budget by $400,000. Um, and Francis also abandoned supervision of the final stages of the commission. But despite that, the very grand parliament buildings were officially opened on the 10th of February, 1898. Francis was not present though. Francis earned a $40,000 commission, which equates to over a million dollars in today's money. Francis quickly embarked on various schemes and plans to increase his wealth. He tried to profit from the Klondike gold rush that was happening at the time. Unfortunately, none of his plans worked out and he ended up losing a fortune. 
Francis ended up returning back to Victoria and went back into architecture for a living. Because of his success in the competition, he was very in demand and he was hired for a lot of projects in Victoria and other parts of the province. It shouldn't be understated how much Francis actually shaped the city. So much of Victoria and its buildings was down to Francis Rattenbury. He had a lot of high profile clients, including the government, the Bank of Montreal and the Canadian Pacific Railway. His best known work was the luxurious Empress Hotel, which was built between 1904 till 1908 and it is one of the oldest hotels in Victoria apparently. For the better part of 20 years Francis was the most prominent and leading architect in British Columbia. He was also the darling of Victoria society but unfortunately Francis sounded like he was a, a major pain in the bum to work with. He was a control freak. He would always be changing his designs constantly. Um, he, he would want lots of expensive last minute changes. Materials that had already been purchased, he would reject and refuse to use. He would argue with anyone who dared to question him. Another terrible habit that Francis had was underestimating costs in order to win contracts and then the contractors would end up having to pay the extra money and it was a lot sometimes. In, fra in fact, Francis, he ended up forcing one of the contractors to the point of bankruptcy. He was also accused of dodgy dealings and conspiring with various people in order to win contracts. So Francis was not a nice man from the sounds of it. He was very talented. People would agree that he was a brilliant architect, but unfortunately he, uh, he was an awful man, both in his professional and personal life. He was described as an ill-tempered and mean man who was extremely frugal with his money. Unfortunately for Francis though, he eventually fell out of favour. He wasn't as in demand anymore and his architectural style just wasn't as popular as it had been. As I mentioned earlier, Francis had no kind of formal training or qualifications and therefore he was soon overtaken by better trained and better educated architects. From about 1906, things started turning really sour for him. He was losing design competitions, whereas before it was pretty certain that he'd win them all. As I mentioned, he designed the Empress Hotel, but he never saw it to completion. There were problems with the plans. Francis was being stubborn and argumentative as usual. And he all of a sudden decided to resign from the project in 1906. He was banking on another potentially lucrative project. The Grand Trunk Railway wanted Francis to design the coast city of Prince Rupert, which was a city not yet built at the time, as well as every hotel and building on a new transcontinental rail line that was going to be built. Francis was excited, as this could mean big bucks and a reinvigoration in his reputation. Charles Melville Hayes, the general manager of Grand Trunk Railway, who was the one who had approached um, Francis. Now Charles had been in England raising funds for the railway and he decided to return home in 1912 on the Titanic. Now we all know how that ends sadly. Tragically Charles and the signed agreements went down with the ship and then Britain declared war on Germany and all architectural work was halted. By 1919 the Grand Trunk Railway was bankrupt. So as well as losing a potentially lucrative job by sticking with the Empress Hotel, Francis also lost a lot of money gambling on the railway. What he had done was to purchase 4,500 hectares of land along the future railway line, hoping that the value of the land would explode with all the, all the new developments with the railway. With the Grand Trunk Railway gone though, all this land was now worthless, essentially, and was also being taxed heavily by the government. 
And another thing, the government were planning on rehoming war veterans in rural areas and under one of the land acts, the province acquired some of Francis's land at a lower price than he had paid. In fact, it kind of got so bad that um, Francis almost went bankrupt. A lot of indigenous communities were displaced, um, though, when the, when the land was originally bought. Francis did not care one bit about that. So I kind of feel like karma had a bit of a hand in everything that happened with the land. His wealth and influence, not that he had much of either at that point, meant that people continued to tolerate him, but they didn't really like him. In subsequent years, things continued to get bad. He kept losing jobs. He, he didn't design many buildings at all, actually. Now, Francis's personal life wasn't much better. Francis had married Florence Nunn in 1898. Florence was the daughter of a retired British Indian army officer turned prospector. There was a lot of gossip behind closed doors as to their engagement. Many thought it was strange that the successful, handsome, charming, wealthy Francis, who was one of the most eligible bachelors in Victoria, would be interested in Florence. Florence had been described as physically unattractive and lacking in social skills, which is really mean, I think. Um, that's basically, basically a description of me. I feel. <laughs> but Florence was also described as very sweet natured and a nice person. Anyway, they married on the 18th of June of that year. And just seven months later, their first child, also named Francis, was born, which kind of confirmed to many people the reason for their uh, apparently strange marriage. They had two children together, the second child being a daughter, Mary. Unfortunately, Francis and Florence weren't very well suited for each other. They ended up disliking each other rather intensely. Florence had showed no interest in being stylish or socially attractive, which annoyed Francis. He'd grown into a rather uh, flamboyant character, but Florence had stayed the same simple, sweet person she'd been when they first met. They continued to live together, but the marriage just kept breaking down. Francis was drinking a lot, and they slept in separate quarters of their home. By 1912, he and his wife weren't on speaking terms at all, and Francis would only communicate with her through their daughter. Francis's life was seemingly falling apart. He was losing projects which normally he'd have won easily. He'd lost his fortune. His career was in shambles. His marriage was failing. He was drinking a lot and becoming very moody. Things weren't looking good. But Francis had a stroke of luck. He was asked to submit plans for a swimming pool. Now, of course, that, that wasn't grand enough for Francis. And he actually designed a very huge, impressive complex called the Crystal Garden, which included ballrooms, um, shops, tropical gardens and pools. This concept eventually got the green light from taxpayers and on the 29th of December 1923, Francis, who was 56 at the time, celebrated his success at the Empress Hotel after winning that important big contract. I should mention that even though Francis conceived the idea for the Crystal Garden Complex, much of the detail work the problem solving and the preparation of the plans, um, they were all the responsibility of Percy L. James, who was also an architect on the project. It's a bit like um, doing a group project at school. You know, one person does, does all the hard work, but it's someone else in the group who gets all the praise and attention. Mm, it's kind of like that. There, Francis bumped into the woman who would change his life. 27-year-old flapper Alma Pakenham. Now, Alma was an interesting person, to say the least. No official record of Alma's birth has ever been found for some reason, but she was a lot younger than Francis. She grew up in British Columbia. In her teenage years, she lived in Vancouver and she was described as brilliantly clever. 
she became a, a very accomplished musician, something she was able to fall back on in later years. She had married young, at 19 years old. Caledon Dolling, who was Irish, more specifically from Ulster, he and Alma married and she followed him to England when he became um, enlisted in the army in World War I. Sadly, Caledon died in the Battle of the Somme. After getting the awful news, Alma joined the French Red Cross and served as an ambulance driver. She was wounded twice and actually ended up being awarded with a French medal for her bravery. At the end of World War I, Alma married for the second time to Captain Packenham and moved with him to America. Now, her husband was already married and uh, Alma ended up being the cause of his marriage ending in divorce. They had a son together, Christopher, but unfortunately their marriage didn't last and Alma and Christopher went back to Victoria to join her mother. Alma went back to music professionally and one night after performing a piano recital in Victoria, she decided to enjoy a relaxing drink at the Empress Hotel. There, she met Francis, who quickly fell in love with her. Alma was a beauty. She was described as beautiful, with a lovely oval face, deep, hauntingly sad eyes and full lips, which easily settled into a pout, at once fashionable and sensuous. Her voice had a warm, vibrant quality, pitched very low, musically slow and distinct. Whew, now that's quite a description. <laughs> Now, Alma was also very much a free spirit. She'd had a very eventful life so far. She'd enjoyed her fame as a musician. Uh, she was a widow and a divorcee. She smoked and drank in public, <gasps> which to be fair was very scandalous back then. <laughs> um, she was what they would have described uh, back then as loose. So Francis, who had been very unhappy in his marriage for a long time, he fell in love with the beautiful, spirited Alma. He was instantly smitten with her. Alma moved to Victoria and leased a small house of which Francis was a regular visitor. The two saw each other a lot and they were inseparable over the next two years. The affair, the affair was kept kind of private at first, but, um, you know, Francis was kind of hoping that everyone would support him because he'd found someone more suitable for him. You know, Florence was never accepted by Victoria society, but there were rumours of drugs and that Alma was a drug addict, as well as someone who drank too much. And, you know, that Francis's behaviour was down to the result of drug use because of Alma. It wasn't long before Francis and Alma decided to just flaunt their affair as much as possible much to the dismay of the upper crust of Victoria. They were seen in public a lot, flaunting their affair. Francis asked Florence for a divorce, but Florence refused. Francis started bringing Alma to his and Florence's home at night, just to hang out in the living room. Florence was also there at home, but she had to hide herself away upstairs. I think Francis was hoping that Florence would be horrified by this behaviour and change her mind about the divorce, but she didn't. Now, people were not happy about this affair. Like, okay, he was a bit of a twerp, to put it mildly, when it came to business, but generally he was seen as a pillar of local society. After the affair became very public though, Francis's peers were appalled with his behaviour and the absolute disregard for Florence's feelings and reputation and they shunned the new couple. Soon, Francis's reputation was gone. No one wanted anything to do with Francis and his lover. They were no longer welcome in Victoria. Francis became desperate to get rid of his wife and he became even more horrible and cruel towards her. He brought Alma over to stay the night, every night basically. Once Francis realised that Florence wouldn't grant him his wish, he decided to move out. When he left, he had the heat and the lights disconnected in their home. It was one last cruel act towards his estranged wife. By, by that point, Florence, she gave up. 
she was humiliated, heartbroken, so she finally gave in and um, agreed to a divorce. After 27 years of marriage, the divorce was finalised on the 28th of January 1925. Francis was finally free to marry Alma. They were married on the 8th of April 1925. Alma also gave him a son, John, in 1928. Unfortunately, though, their reputations were in ruins. Francis was no longer getting any commissions and therefore not making any money. They were no longer invited to, to dinners or parties or social engagements. In fact, people just no longer spoke to either of them. They were publicly shunned. Francis and Alma, along with their, uh, her infant son Christopher and their son John, they decided on a fresh start and moved and settled down in Bournemouth, England in 1929. Unfortunately, it would end up being the last few years of Francis's life. The move to England unfortunately didn't bring any improvement in their finances and they still weren't able to recover their social standing. Luckily, Francis had quite a bit of savings, so they lived fairly comfortably in a house dubbed the Villa Madeira. But Francis, who already had a reputation for being very frugal, he was even more obsessed about money now that he had no income. Alma tried to reassure him, telling him that soon she'd be making good money once she re-established her reputation as a renowned and in-demand musician. She actually did pretty well um, establishing herself as a successful radio singer and songwriter. Francis wasn't too impressed though. I mean, I don't know if it, if it wasn't enough money for him, but he lost interest, more concerned about his own diminishing financial resources. He soon sank further and further into depression. Their relationship started falling apart. Francis, he wasn't doing good. He had become more and more moody and despondent and his health was failing. He was mostly deaf as well at that point. He was also impotent. He and Alma hadn't had sex since the birth of their son, John. He became very reclusive and would spend most evenings alone, drunk, sleeping on his own downstairs, feeling depressed and often threatening suicide as well. In September 1934, an advert was placed in the local newspaper. It said, quote, Daily willing lad, 14 to 19, for housework. Scout trained preferred. Francis, who was 67 at the time, and Alma, around 39 years old at the time, they were looking for a local boy to help around their house. Also living in their home was Alma's son by a previous marriage, 13-year-old Christopher, their own son, 6-year-old John, and Alma's live-in housekeeper, Irene Riggs. The couple hired 18-year-old George Stoner, who, as well as being the handyman, um, being someone who could drive, he also took on the role of chauffeur, which was a big help to the Rattenbury's. George was shy and retiring. He'd been a loner as a child, kept himself to himself. He didn't really have many friends and he certainly didn't have any girlfriends. According to reported accounts, George also wasn't too bright. Whilst Francis was steadily falling more and more unhappy, Alma craved excitement. You know, she was still young. She still performed as a musician. Um, she just wanted some attention in her life. Young George was perfect for her. Many people think that it was Alma who initiated their passionate affair, seeing as she was quite a bit older and more experienced. By November of that year, George had moved into the home and had become Alma's live-in lover, living in their spare bedroom. It is thought that Francis knew all about the affair between Alma and George. I mean, it would have been very difficult to not know what was going on. Um, they weren't exactly living in a huge, sprawling mansion. And it's thought that because of his health and his impotence, he didn't object to his wife's affair. George used to visit Alma's bedroom at night. Their affair went on for a few months. There was a change in George though. 
Once shy, he became very aggressive and possessive of Alma. He was jealous when Alma spent time with Francis. George was obsessed with Alma. He was young, jealous, not in control of his emotions. Any time that Alma suggests that they, that they break off their affair, he would fly into a rage. On the 24th of March, 1935, things reached a boiling point. Not long before that, Alma and George had returned home from a lover's holiday to London. Francis was feeling particularly depressed and talking of suicide, so to try and comfort him and make him feel better, Alma organised for them to visit a friend in Bridport the following weekend of the 23rd and 24th. George seemed to have misinterpreted her intention, jealous once again of the attention she was giving to Francis. On the afternoon of the Sunday, the 24th of March, George had borrowed a wooden mallet from his grandparents, supposedly to erect a screen in the garden. Later that evening, in his sitting room, Alma found Francis seriously injured and bloodied. A Dr O'Donnell was summoned to the house where Francis was laying there, unconscious and his head bathed in blood. The doctor said that, quote, Mrs Rattenbury was most excited. She was holding a glass of whiskey and soda. She was clad in pyjamas and wore no shoes. Somebody finished him, the doctor quoted her as saying. It wasn't until the blood was wiped away from his head that they realised that Francis had actually been struck multiple times and struck really hard with a weapon that turned out to be the very same mallet that George had brought over. Police went over to the Villa Madeira. It was early hours on Monday morning. Alma was either drunk or on drugs. Now, Alma had initially told the doctor that Francis must have fallen and hit his head on the piano. By the time the police had arrived, her story had changed and she told them that Francis had tried to kill himself with the mallet. Her story changed yet again when she told them that she had done it, that she had hit him. And then, oh no, actually, George admitted to it. George did it. Yeah, she definitely wasn't with it at that point. She was either drunk or high or both and probably not making much sense. She allegedly offered a policeman money and then tried to kiss him. Yikes. She was arrested for attempted murder because Francis was still alive at this point. George had also confessed to the murder to the housekeeper Irene that, that he had done it and he was also arrested. Apparently there were rumours that George was addicted to cocaine and it was suggested that he was all confused and affected by the drugs. On the Thursday, Francis Rattenbury died of his injuries. It was now murder. Instead of being tried locally, on the 27th of May 1935, both Alma and George were tried together at the Old Bailey in London. The case was one of the most sensational and notorious of that year and definitely far too sensational and attracted far too much attention to be tried locally. Both Alma and George were advised by their legal teams to plead not guilty. George's counsel pleaded temporary insanity. Their approaches were very different. George barely spoke and he didn't testify. He was portrayed as a cocaine addict who had killed Francis because he was in the way, essentially. Alma, on the other hand, had a very passionate defence. On the witness stand, she admitted to, quote, improper relations between herself and George, but she asserted that her husband knew all about it. She also said that she'd been asleep when George woke her up to tell her that he had hurt her husband. On the 30th of May, George's counsel admitted that he had struck the fatal blow, but stressed that Stoner was addicted to drugs and that he was under their influence that day. 
on the 31st of May, after deliberating for just less than an hour, the jurors brought in their verdict. Alma was found innocent of the charges, but George was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death by hanging. Alma collapsed in court after George's sentencing. It does seem likely that it was just George that committed the crime. Alma's explanation for why she had admitted to it in the first place um, was because of her love for George and that she was covering for him. George had he'd already exhibited signs of aggression and jealousy. Um, one theory I read was that George was in a jealous rage about Francis and Alma's upcoming visit to Bridport and that, you know, he'd only intended to harm Francis enough to stop them going um, and that murdering him was just an accident. We'll never, we'll never know if he truly intended to kill Francis or not. Even though George was the one that killed Francis, it doesn't surprise me and probably won't surprise you to hear that the public was siding with George and they didn't like Alma one bit. She was an older woman who had led astray an innocent young man. She had manipulated him to do it. But yes, what Alma did wasn't right. Having an affair and, and seducing a young and naive man, boy, really. Uh, but at the end of the day, George was still the one who wielded the weapon and ended up killing Francis. But even today, there are, there are many who still believe that Alma was the real killer and that George was taking the blame for her. She was booed by the crowd as she left the Old Bailey and the press were merciless when reporting about her. Now, I'm going to be talking more about suicide um, and reading some extracts from a few suicide notes and letters. If you've been watching up till now but don't want to listen to the next bit, because uh, it's, you know, it's a lot, um, I will put a, a timestamp on screen um, for you to skip to so you can completely bypass all of that. Four days later, Alma took the train to Christchurch, a town not too far from Bournemouth, and walked across the meadows to a railway bridge by the River Stour. She wrote some notes and letters and then walked towards the water. Tragically, she then plunged the knife into her heart six times and threw herself into the river. By the time she was pulled from the water, she was dead. An extract from a note written on an envelope said, quote, It is beautiful here. It must be easier to be hanged than to have to do the job oneself especially in these circumstances of being watched all the while. Another extract from a letter was, quote, I want to make it perfectly clear that no one is responsible for what action I may take regarding my life. I quite made up my mind at Holloway Prison to finish things and it will only be a matter of time and opportunity. Every night and every minute is only prolonging the appalling agony of mind. Alma had already considered other methods of killing herself and contemplated other places where she could carry out the tragic act. Quote, I tried this morning to throw myself under a train at Oxford Circus. There were too many people about. Then a bus, and still too many people about. One must be bold to do a thing like this. It is beautiful here and I am alone. Thank God for peace at last. It is clear from the notes and letters that she had written during their affair and even during the trial that she really did seem to love George and that she really was heartbroken by the, by the result of the trial. George was also heartbroken when told of Alma's death. He broke down and cried. A petition was started for George, who had been led astray, according to the public, to reduce his death sentence. The petition eventually gathered 320,000 signatures, including those of the local mayor and MP. The letter was handed to the Home Secretary, who reduced George's sentence to penal servitude for life. He was a model prisoner. And because of his good behaviour, he was released seven years later in 1942 to join the army and fight in World War II. He 
survived the war and he lived the rest of his life in the house he had left at the age of 18 in Bournemouth. He and his wife lived, lived a rather quiet, uneventful life, except for the time that he was found naked in a public bathroom in 1990 with a 12-year-old boy. He was 73, 74 years old at the time. He was convicted of indecent assault and given two years probation. George Stoner eventually died in 2000, aged 83. Decades after the trial, questions were still being asked about what happened. Um, George, he would keep getting visits from reporters trying to find out the alleged truth. Um, George actually made a statement in 1999 to a reporter from the Bournemouth Daily Echo. He said, quote, the whole crime was committed on an emotional basis. Both I and the lady involved were in a highly emotional state. Some people think that he's alluding to the idea that he had a partner in the murder, maybe Alma. Personally, I don't think so. Um, I personally think that he was just referring to their affair, that it was very intense for them both, um, and particularly for him and that the affair and his feelings were so strong um, and that they were the reason why he did it. It's obviously something that we're never likely to discover. Um, was it really just George involved in Francis's murder? Did Alma do it? And that's why, riddled with guilt and facing the prospect of living the rest of her life in disgrace, she decided to kill herself. Did they do it together? And George ended up taking the fall. We she'll never know. Francis Rattenbury ended up being buried in an unmarked grave in Bournemouth. 72 years later in 2007 a headstone was finally erected being paid for by a family friend. Alma was also buried in an unmarked grave in the same cemetery. Now that is the end of the physical life of Francis Rattenbury but it isn't the end of the story when it comes to Francis's spirit. Hmm. So, Francis's ghost decided to make its way back to Canada, in particular to the Parliament, Parliament buildings and the Empress Hotel. Staff working alone after hours in the Parliament buildings have reported hearing footsteps, whistling voices and papers rustling in empty offices. A dark shadowy figure has also been seen in the hallways. The face of the ghost can't be seen properly but many believe it to be the ghost of Francis Rattenbury. At his beloved Empress Hotel an apparition is regularly spotted by both guests and staff. It is a tall slender dashing man who has a moustache and is holding a cane and wearing a top hat. He often walks down the beautiful wooden staircases to the lower lobby and down hallways. The spirit is said to be that of Francis. He won a lot of praise for the legislative buildings and the hotel so it's no wonder that he decided to return to the places where he felt good and where he received all of this praise and acclaim, you know, rather than the sad, depressing home in Bournemouth where he was murdered. I always wonder, like, how, how do ghosts travel? Like, are they capable of teleportation, essentially? Like, popping up in a completely different country? I'm assuming his spirit just appeared in Victoria after his death, as um, that was obviously where he was most happy. Um, but I like, the, I like the idea of his ghost, like sitting on a plane or in a ship, um, travelling across the world back to Victoria, you know, sitting with alive people. Hmm. Thankfully, the, the two innocent sons who were caught up in the case both went on to lead happy lives, thankfully, with their own families and they had successful professional careers. One of them actually went on to be a successful architect. There doesn't seem to be much information on Florence, but I hope she managed to live out the rest of her life in peace and happiness. I suppose it is still a very intriguing case to a lot of people. It was a sensation at the time, you know, the case involved sex, drugs and murder. Francis's murder is still a mystery to, to many people as, as there are those that refuse to believe the verdict. 
As for me and what I think, it's difficult. I do believe that George acted alone. I think he was very young and emotionally not fully developed, um, as no one is at that age. And it sounds like he was very impressionable as well. But I think he let the jealousy get to him and he lost control. You know, he'd already showed signs of aggression and, and was very possessive as well. I think that Alma felt some blame having, you know, having this affair that led to her husband's death and then thinking that her lover was going to be executed. That obviously pushed her over the edge. Could she have either worked together with George to kill Francis or or even just kind of put the suggestion in his mind, knowing that he would be likely to do it? Potentially, yes, but like I said, we're likely never to find out. It's a shame because Francis really defined the architecture of, of Victoria and British Columbia. Like there are so many buildings in British Columbia that were designed by him, but sadly, his scandals and sordid personal life, and in the end, his murder, overshadowed any of his professional achievements. It's such a sad case, like, I feel like so much of this could have been avoided. Like, if only different choices were made, much of this probably wouldn't have happened. And there's so much tragedy evolved in this case, and I feel like the three main people, um, Francis, Alma and George, all of them have some blame for things and ending up the way they did. You know, so much damage done, in the name of love, or lust, or both. You know, jealousy is a, a very powerful motive. Well, thank you for hanging out with me today, my darlings. It was a long one, I know, but there was just so much to the case. Um, and Francis and Alma were certainly very interesting people. They'd, they'd done a lot in their lives. Have any of you stayed at the Empress Hotel? And if so, did you experience any sightings of Francis's ghost? Um, please let me know if you have, because I would be so interested to hear about it. So thank you for, for joining me. I hope the wind wasn't too windy. <laughs> it's, um, yes, it, and lots of rustling and, and, you know, background noises. I hope it's okay. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to have to do it again. My hat stayed on. Yay! <laughs> anyway, if you liked this video, please um, give it a like. Uh, follow the channel if you haven't already. And I will see you next time for another Cup of Terror.